I blame various YouTube commenters for me hanging with the bison today. They commented on my last episode, which had to do with beef, where I made the loose comment that buffalo and beef were not the same for grasslands. And they said, oh, you gotta explain yourself now. We need a director's cut with all the stuff, because you threw that overboard. I had to bust out my giant lens so you could get an idea of how magnificent these creatures really are. You yeah, turn your head, you're too big, come through straight. He's certainly not your average house pet, with a face only a mother could love. Hello, sugar booger. Yep. That sugar boy is a full-grown bison. He weighs approximately 2,500. His head probably weighs around 400. One tragedy of beef is how devastating it is for the environment, more than any other food. So there are very noble efforts to raise cows on grass, not over graze, and do all the regenerative agriculture things like no-till. You get happier cows, and you hope to get healthier meat and a healthier planet. Regenerative agriculture sounds so good, the meat industry is having great success with their ads. That's why General Mills was one of the first companies to partner with farmers on six key farming principles to help rebuild what we have lost. There are two statements that have stuck with me from my beef episode from people who promote cows. Here's the first. The, the vast herds of, of grazing animals, you know, pre-Columbian era in the, the Americas, why was the planet not destroyed then? In part one of this episode, we'll take a closer look at that statement because it is a very fair question. Here's the second statement. And we found that grasslands can capture as much carbon as forests can. In part two of this episode, we'll take a look at fascinating, critical things about grasslands and forests that hardly anyone knows. And in part three, we'll figure out what it all means for paleo diets, grass-fed beef, and regenerative agriculture. Part one, my favorite classes while getting my earth science degrees were paleontology because you got to study the fantastical creatures that roam the planet. Star Wars came out when I was taking paleontology, and I thought, wait, did George Lucas get inspired by paleontology? 45 years later, we might actually be on the verge of seeing elephant Wookiees come back from extinction. The narrative I heard for years is when hunter-gatherers made it to North America maybe 14,000-ish years ago, they were hungry and mammoth barbecue was apparently delicious, so we ate them all. <sighs> Modern archaeologists say be careful making that conclusion because there were other influences. If you have heard that they became extinct because they were hunted to death by human hunters, I would claim that you still don't know why they became extinct. By the way, if you get your paleontology knowledge from Disney, take heart. The movie Ice Age amazes me. I've actually looked on the web to see if I could find out who knew enough about the Ice Age to do those reconstructions because they're really good. There's a glyptodont in there. Um, there are South American animals in there that North Americans generally have never heard of. It's a great movie. Hey, buddy, you see any humans go by here? In any case, the important thing for our story is the extinction seemed to boost some species like bison pronghorns, who blanketed the grasslands by the tens of millions and sustained many native tribes for over 10,000 years. In the early 1800s, the grasslands were like the American Serengeti. It's hard to believe we hunted bison to near extinction by the late 1800s. So you've got around 350,000 human beings and maybe 10 million stock animals coming across the Overland Trails. And the bison were introduced to anthrax, to malignant catarrhal fever, to Texas tick fever, and a host of other things that they did not have any immunity to. The bison paddock you saw me in front of was established in 1890 when bison were almost gone and they had a breeding program that produced 100 calves. So William Hornaday and Theodore Roosevelt started the American Bison Society. Some animals were taken to the Bronx Zoo, others to other states to establish these satellite populations. The first difference with bison is they move a lot. If you take bison and you allow them to move in the natural way that they move, they cover a far broader range of area. That helps them spread grass seeds in their poop far and wide. And they don't tend to overgraze like cattle do. They are top grazers rather than uh, removing the whole plant. Cattle can flare their, their lips to use their teeth to eat down to the dirt. 
And bison cannot do that. So you've always got a little bit of grass left, which is a nutrient provider for the roots of those plants. The second thing is they're adapted to drier areas with coarser brush. The molars in a bison jaw have twice the occlusive surface that a beef cows, which means twice the grinding surface. And that, that food bolus travels more slowly through the system, so they get more out of it. They eat a lot of things that a beef cow won't eat just because they spent 200,000 years evolving with the native plants in North America. This is all yucca. When we bought this ranch 25 years ago, we probably had 60 to 80 acres of yucca. And the bison have pretty much extirpated most of it, but this damage here was all caused by, by bison, especially in the winter time. They use yucca as a grazing resource. So bison do significantly change the land just as far as, as the way that they use the resources, because with the yucca gone, that means that more threadleaf sedge, we have some needle and thread here, uh, some western wheat grass over there. So all of this, this resource that was in, in yucca and some of the juniper is now being turned back into grassland again. They will wander five miles from water, whereas cattle, which came to this continent with Columbus and the Europeans, are more adapted to wetter environments and tend to stay near the water. The third is they're adapted to the cold of northern climes. The weather is something that they can handle, no matter how it comes, blazing heat, blizzards, and they face into the wind. The big one in 84 was four days, and uh, we couldn't get to them for four days. By the time we got out to them, they had broken up into small groups. They were grazing up on the hilltops where the snow had blown off. They were right smack in the middle of calving. There was probably 500 baby calves on the ground at the time. We think they stopped calving during the blizzard. We never found a dead calf. Uh, our fences were lined with dead cattle and sheep from the neighbors. Ranchers have to build barns and confine cattle in colder areas. There are definitely some non-intuitive things about bison as grazing animals when you reintroduce predators like wolves, as they did in Yellowstone. So here we have the lower jaw from a yearling bison. One huge thing that comes from wolves making kills is it feeds a whole ecosystem. So a lot of times these carcasses bring in different scavengers like ravens, eagles, coyotes, fox, bears. And there was a signal of songbirds coming back as well. It's filled with birds. And that's not what it was like 25 years ago. And so I think back to the moment of letting those wolves go a lot. Now imagine if you can cows trying to survive and fill the ecological niche of bison and trying to outrun a pack of wolves. This is the animal Mother Nature designed. We don't want an animal that is reliant upon us um, and, and that we have to vaccinate two times a year and all this stuff. We don't use subtherapeutic antibiotics. We don't use hormones. But bison raised for meat are often finished with grain, like a lot of grass-fed beef is. Most of the industry today has gone to grain finishing for the last three to six months. It's under 10% of the bison out there that is uh, fully grass-fed and finished. But supplying grass-finished meat to the general public has drawbacks that most consumers don't realize. It's not that easy. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of art to it. And you really can taste the difference between the animals that come from one piece of land uh, or another. For many, the flavor and texture can be gamey and challenging to cook. Cooking a really lean, entirely grass-fed animal is a little bit more challenging than cooking something that has that margin of error. One downside of bison is they wander outside Yellowstone boundaries and clash with cattle ranchers. So we have this line in the sand, a literal line in the sand, where you have Yellowstone National Park on one side, where bison are respected and admired as a native wildlife species. I mean, iconic. People come from around the world to come celebrate this animal. Step right across that line and you enter Montana, where they're pretty much treated as vermin and the Montana Department of Livestock has a vested interest in protecting the economic interests of the livestock industry. They're also wild animals, so fences have to be strong and tall, and bison are hard to round up. These animals are wild and wily. 
They have great vision, can outrun a horse for a short distance. They also can jump, and fences that are made to contain bison have to be at least seven feet tall. So think of an animal that weighs between 800 and 2,000 pounds being able to jump over my head. We've been running bison on horseback long enough to where we realize this is not the solution. Someone's gonna get hurt badly. We basically figured out a lot better way to do it. It looks like you're in control, but you're not. At points, sometimes you're, you and your vehicle are in the middle of this, this swirl. Yeah, it's just chaos. Like a little bison bomb goes off. And when it comes to adorable comfort animals, it's definitely cows for the win. Well, except for Sugar Boy, of course. So, to answer Rob Wolf's question, why was the planet not destroyed then? You're comparing very different species, very different range management, and a closed system where everything gets returned to the soil and stays in the grasslands, not shipped away for city folk to eat in Manhattan. Not comparable. Bison are often considered the keystone species to North American grasslands, but that brings me to part two. I think humans were the keystone species. We think of grasslands as being wild, the product of ecologies with animals like bison and wolves. But for millennia, native tribes used fire to shape the landscape. There are entire books, which I read, about how Indians used fire to eliminate some forests where enemies could hide to control mosquitoes, ticks and fleas, and to expand grassland for the bison. The North Fork Mono and most of the other Mono groups have been here for 15,000 years. When the Indian was out on the land, they always burned. Even in the wooded East Coast, many tribes routinely lit ground fires to keep the brush at bay and also to prevent future megafires. Smart. I keep telling everybody that for centuries when the Indians burned all the time, then they could, they could come through and do a broadcast burn underneath, burn all these <laughs> sowberries without burning these trees. Understanding those details of the ways in which fire was used for thousands of years helps us better understand what that relationship with fire can look like and what that relationship with the land can look like. These grasslands evolved with grazing, principally by bison. And so if you're trying to put Humpty back together again, you start with some of the bigger pieces, more important pieces. Bison were the primary historical grazer. Boom, let's put those guys back. And bison aren't the only thing these prairies need to survive. They also crave fire. Bob's team burns as much as a third of the preserve each year. That may sound like a lot, but it mimics the ancient seasons of fire that were once common on these prairies. These native prairies have evolved with fire. If you remove fire from the prairie, it fairly quickly converts to a woodland. For a long time, we were trying to get the people who were in control to listen to us about keeping fire on the land, and we didn't have a lot of success. And it was uh, even illegal, and Indians would get put in jail or something for, for starting a fire. One of, the, one of the ways you can tell if the burn has been a good burn is by just doing this. You got little sprouts coming up already. So you could just wipe away the black, and then it's soil again. If it was a one of those big bad fires, the burn goes a lot deeper than just the top layer. Speaking of native tribes, I got a kick out of this white YouTuber from New York who busted out his Navajo language skills to some pretty shocked Navajos. She a YouTuber, she of a video, video, ash, 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 lava, but he ne, he ne visa, uh, the whole shot. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> when Frank Mittlener spoke to a group of Irish ranchers and said grasslands were comparable to forests as carbon sinks, he was referencing California fires. He is the master of spin and used the word reliable. Yeah, California forests are burning, so they're no longer reliable carbon sinks. The Amazon is turning into a carbon source too because it's burning to provide pasture for cows. Grasslands emit less carbon when they catch fire because they contain less carbon. The context of Frank's talk to Irish ranchers might make your head explode because Ireland and Scotland share the same problem. This is what most of Scotland would have looked like in the Highlands at least several thousand years ago. And now we've got less than 1% of this old forest left. And everywhere you go, you see the signs of this. The stumps of the old pine trees exposed in the peat hags and the standing lonely skeletons. Humans cleared most of the trees there. Ted made Alan Savory famous for saying we need cattle to reclaim depleted land. 
But Scottish ecologist Alan Watson Featherstone is doing an incredibly impressive job of reforesting Scotland by keeping grazers out until the trees are no longer edible snacks for them. So here inside the fence, there's been no grazing for 28 years now. So this is one of the first Scots pines that I planted here in Glen Affric 28 years ago. And at the time, this area was a desolate, open, barren, treeless landscape, just like the peat hag outside here. And this tree has grown really well. It's now putting on over a foot of growth a year. It's really flourishing. In the early 90s, Alan set up a charity and began planting. Alan himself has planted 50,000 trees. The charity, nearly two million. Pine martens and osprey are naturally returning. Have you heard that new growth forests are best for the planet? I did too, but the idea seems to have come from logging and biofuels marketing. Fortunately, Sine has put up instruments to actually measure it. Dr. Law and her team measure the carbon absorbed into and released from the forest using a complex system of towers above the canopy and instruments underground. And then soil microbes are decomposing things, so they give off carbon dioxide. People are being told or thought that young trees grow fast and vigorous. But when you look at the forest, the net of all the respiration and photosynthesis makes them a source. Mature and old forests are the workhorses. They take up more carbon annually and they have a lot more stored in the wood. So this is a clear cut, right? Yeah, they cut everything, all that's left of the stumps. Even if you were to replant it and it was a successful replanting, meaning the regeneration didn't die every year because it's too dry, it takes 10 to 20 years for these forests to become a net sink again. Coast Range Forests in Oregon store the most carbon per acre in the world, even more than the Amazon. And you can see why, there's carbon everywhere. But these old growth ecosystems are extremely rare. Scientists estimate that 95% of forests in the Northwest have been cut at least once. Those are the forests if you were to look over all of the North America and you said, where are the places that will do the most? It's the Pacific Northwest and then up into Southeast Alaska and Tongass National Forest, let them grow. Set them aside as carbon reserves. I call it strategic carbon reserves to help fight climate change. Welcome to the home of wonderful Mayan family here in the Yucatan. The dad is a professor of agricultural science who's written many beautiful books, including this one on dragon fruit. I can tell she likes you. Oh, much better. Much better. They have the most adorable mini piggy ever. I shot this episode in the San Francisco Bay Area and I didn't expect to record here, but when I was editing, that statement from Frank Mittlener kept bothering me. We found that grasslands can capture as much carbon as forests can. And to me that is, to me that is, to me that's very interesting. This, this research has been published, this research has been published, it's uh, open for the world to read. So I'll interject a little more about that from here. Why is his view so different from what other scientists are measuring? He tweeted a link to a paper published by Dr. Ben Holton's group from UC Davis. Ben has a great reputation. Ben's group didn't agree that grasslands can store as much carbon as healthy forests. In a stable climate, trees store more carbon than grasslands, said co-author Holton, director of the John Muir Institute of Environment at UC Davis. But in a vulnerable, warming, drought-likely future, we could lose some of the most productive carbon sinks on the planet. The paper is about modeling the future if global warming takes out more California trees. One of Ben's postdoctoral students submitted a video as part of the abstract. Nice. You can see the basic arithmetic that trees store way more carbon both above and below the ground than grasslands do. But what happens when California forests catch fire? In the event of a wildfire, the amount of carbon emitted into the atmosphere by grasslands is much lower compared to that of forests. And this difference is amplified by the business as usual climate change scenario as we move into the future. They modeled a scenario where global temperatures rose 1.7 degrees Celsius. We're almost there in California. And at that temperature, forests are far superior to grasslands for carbon storage. But they also modeled 4.8 degrees centigrade temperature rise, 
And at that temperature, a big percentage of California forests burn, and to no one's surprise, grasslands outperform burned down trees. That's what scientists are often referring to when they talk about tipping points. We've deforested enough of the planet for raising cattle and sheep that global temperatures have risen, causing more forests to go up in flames. In that context, Frank is right. Grasslands can store more carbon than forests that went up in flames. And that brings us to part three, paleo diets, grass-fed beef, and regenerative agriculture. If the Lakota wrote a cookbook, maybe it would be called Bison, It's What's for Dinner. Tribes in the Northeast might write, Seafood and berries by summer, bear and moose in winter. In New England, the popular books would be How to Grow Squash, Corn, and Beans Together in One Field. In the Southeast, where they lived off oak, hickory, and chestnut trees, the book might be Nuts, How to Collect and Store Acorns and Nuts for Year-Round Goodness. And if you go to the mind-blowing Incas, Within just a few decades, they build the largest empire in the world. The bestseller would probably be How to Build an Empire on Quinoa, Potatoes, Squash, Beans, and Tomatoes. So what the heck is a paleo diet besides no hyper-processed foods? I'm a paleoanthropologist at the University of Arkansas. I study human evolution, and more specifically, I reconstruct the diets of our ancient ancestors. Our diets varied over time and space with shifting availabilities of different kinds of foods. And in fact, this is what allowed our ancestors to find something to eat no matter where they roamed. Whether it's up in the high Arctic, where nearly all of their food was marine mammals and fish, or down by the equator, where they could take 70% of their calories from sugary melons and starchy roots. Our evolution has prepared us for versatility that's allowed us to take over the world. So which diet can keep us from destroying the world? I couldn't find much data on bison versus beef, but we have really good data on beef versus everything else. If you really look at everything that went into making a single serving of beef, you end up emitting around 330 grams of carbon. That's like driving a car three miles. Now, if I choose to have chicken instead, there's more than a five-fold drop in emissions. Switch to fish, and you see the number go down even more. Now, look at veggies. If I swapped beef out entirely for lentils, well, I'm down to practically nothing. And as for regenerative agriculture, the term is mainly used in the context of raising cows on grass. Unfortunately, even pro-beef studies funded by General Mills show that cows on grass emit 35% more greenhouse gases than cows on grain and use 2.5 times the land, land which could be used for forests. In that context, the accurate term for regenerative agriculture is degenerative agriculture. But Chris, you say, surely grass-fed beef is healthier, it's cows eating their greens. I'll let the regenerative agriculture gurus answer that question. You know, grass-fed beef isn't is not, uh, you know, according to what's out there, significantly more nutrient dense uh, to humans than feedlot finished beef. It's just, there's just not a significant difference. Thanks so much for watching. And I'm sorry to deliver some bad news, but I have some great news. And that is at age 95, Sir David Attenborough looks fantastic. And he's working on a new documentary. He doesn't like to give bad news either, but he has such a simple and hopeful message which is we can all do a lot to slow down global warming just by cutting way back on the meat that we eat. I can't wait to hear your comments and you know what to do.